Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Miguel Palacios, and I will be the moderator of the next session. The session will talk about hydrogen innovation and technology. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here uh, for a professor like me in a business school, ESET Business School, where we have several programs in uh, energy. It's a pleasure and an honor to get invited by HAEE -E, um, to this uh, moderating session. And it's also a pleasure because the speakers that we're going to have in the session are excellent speakers, in my opinion, very knowledgeable about the subject, either hydrogen, innovation, or technology. And the session will cover, uh, probably depending on the speaker, more one or the other topics. Uh, depending also on the speaker, we may take questions afterwards. That may be the case of some of the speakers that have to leave. But we will try to leave the questions for the end of all of them or those who can stay. So I will be introducing uh, the keynote speakers and the participants one by one. And uh, when it's their time to participate and join the session. So first, uh, we have, in fact, uh, the only name that I think I will be able to pronounce right, because the speakers come from all over the world, is Enrique Viguera Rubio. Um, I will do a short presentation of all the speakers, but very short, just highlighting some elements of their CV that I found especially interesting and related to this conference. You have the full CV uh, in, in the conference uh, webpage. So uh, Mr. Enrique Viguera Rubio is the Spanish ambassador to the Hellenic Republic. Uh, he's the Spanish ambassador since July 2017. Uh, he has a very extensive experience being ambassador in Spain in, in several continents. Uh, but perhaps what is more relevant uh, to this conference is that he was appointed ambassador for large energy issues at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 2010. And he held this position for several years. He also has a lot of experience in European matters since he has been representing Spain in front of the European Union. So he's very knowledgeable about all what has to do with the European Union and energy specifically. Uh, he has a degree in law from Semil University and then he studied at the College of Europe in Bruges, Belgium, and the, obviously the International Relations at Spain School of Diplomacy. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to give the word to Mr. Enrique Viguera. Uh, I understand that he has a presentation to share with us. Thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, and thank you very much for the HAE for uh, counting on me uh, on this uh, particular opportunity. Um, uh, I, I've been uh, in, in invited to this uh, symposium for several years now, and I try also always to, to keep Hello, uh, Enrique. We lost our voice at the beginning, so we, we heard the first phrases, 
but then we don't hear you anymore. Something happened, you muted, you must be muted on your computer. We don't hear you. No, no, we don't hear you. We don't hear you. So, uh, Enrique, if you don't mind, we while we fix the sound, we go to the next. Uh, we go to the next speaker. Are you okay? If, if you make, if you make an okay, if you hear me, we, we will go. We will go to the next speaker in the round table, and then we will come back to you while the sound gets fixed. Okay, so sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, we have now uh, Maria Espiraki. In fact, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing the name right, uh, who is a member of the European Parliament. Um, She's, uh, in, in fact, she was awarded a uh, member of the European Parliament of the year 2019 for industry research and innovation. Um, she is the co-chair of the Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, and at the renovation wave uh, of the M M1 committee. So, uh, Mrs. Spiraki is, I mean, he's a very experienced journalist and politician. So we have a very experienced journalist and politician who has a degree in chemistry and a master in energy law, business and regulatory science and policy from the International Hellenic University. It's, I think it's, it's a very, very, very interesting speaker for our round table. Thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for having me in this very interesting conference. And uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about the, the next uh, silver bullet coming from, from our path, from the, from the European Union, which is, which is hydrogen. And I would like to say that, uh, first of all, for starting the discussion, we have to take into account that we have to safeguard security of supply. And of course, we have to safeguard the affordability of our energy to the end users. It is our citizens as consumers and the industry as well. In this regard, I would like to focus on four aspects, which according to my opinion, are important. First is time. Second is infrastructures. Third is technology for smooth and fast transition. And the fourth is investments. Of course, now we have natural gas, and natural gas is accepted as a traditional fuel in our Green Deal text in order to meet the 2030 targets. Switching from gas to coal in the power sector is, of course, the easiest way to reduce emissions at scale in a very short term. In this regard, I would like to say that, uh, technologically speaking, we have to use the carbon capture storage and carbon capture use technologies at scale in order to obtain hydrogen as gas. Of course, we have the opportunity of renovation wave and we have to replace the old fashioned heating and cooling systems. And we have also to, to expand the capacity of renewable energy. And at the same time, parallel, we have to invest in grids. But allow me to say that it is a short and maybe a mid-term approach. The case is how fast can we enable future-oriented projects. And by saying this, I would like to say that the key element is how to develop huge quantities of green hydrogen. It is of paramount importance to develop and implement a coherent and concrete European strategy for hydrogen. Ice hydrogen has a high potential of a clean energy sources for the future and it is considered as a key enabler of the energy system integration and the linking of electricity and gas sectors. As, and according to my opinion, the key question is how can we accelerate the transition from the current period to the hydrogen period? In the transition to a net zero emission EU energy system, hydrogen will play a major role in a smart combination with renewable electricity using Europe's well-developed existing energy infrastructures. 
for hydrogen to develop to its full potential, there must be a tangible perspective towards developing a well-connected European hydrogen market over time. Having said that, it is important to have two parameters. The first one is the strategy. The EU European strategy sets the objective of reaching 6 gigawatt of renewable hydrogen production by 2024 and by 2030 target of 40 gigawatt. Hydrogen is set to play an important role in meeting the EU's energy and climate targets to 2030 and achieve climate neutrality by 2050. However, in the 2030 target plan, impacts assessment, the Commission only foresees 11 to 12 gigawatts of renewable hydrogen production, and probably it is not enough. The second is how can we manage this kind of situation of new situation? The European Clean Hydrogen Alliance has also announced to create a platform for stakeholders, including, among others, the industry, the civil society, the Commission, and to accelerate the development of European hydrogen economy and the hydrogen market. However, the works of the Alliance have yet to start, and there is a little clarity related to its governance. So, we have a lot of work to do at the very beginning. And it is important to know that in the transition to, to the net zero emissions in the EU energy system, hydrogen will play a major role in a smart combination with renewable electricity using Europe's well-developed existing energy infrastructure. For hydrogen to develop to its full potential, there must be a tangible perspective towards developing a well-connected European hydrogen market over time. The first step is that we have to upgrade the existing gas infrastructure. We have gas infrastructure and we have to avoid stranded assets. Hydrogen production could take place on site close to where it is used. However, it is not always the most efficient supply option. For instance, in case there were hydrogen consumers are located away from large supply or re renewable electricity or CCS location and have access to existing gas grids, it will be cost effective to receive hydrogen through gas grids. Existing gas infrastructures can be used with some modification to safely transport hydrogen. In addition, the connection to a hydrogen network increases security of supply significantly. Pipeline transport is far cheaper towards to, uh, compared with, with hydrogen transport via shipping. However, the latter could become relevant for very long distance transport for hydrogen beyond several thousands of kilometers. Pipeline transport of hydrogen can either take the form of blending shares of hydrogen with methane or can be dedicated hydrogen trans transport. Blending makes sense when, when hydrogen volumes are small. When hydrogen volumes increase while transported volumes of natural gas decrease, dedicated hydrogen transport will emerge initially connecting industrial clusters and later connecting regional and national hydrogen infrastructure. At the same time, with upgrading by upgrading the existing gas infrastructures and avoiding stranded assets, we have to build additional infrastructure, whatever it needs, by investing on a basis of integral EU plan and also following the criteria of taxonomy and IB new leading policy. Which means that a vision for a truly European undertaking connecting hydrogen supply and demand from the north to south, from the west to east, should be developed. This leads to an initial 6,800 km pipeline network by 2030, connecting hydrogen valleys. The planning for this first phase should start as soon as possible and with no delay. The hydrogen backbone, this is the, the wording that we use in this regard concerning this kind of very, very important project of common interest, is a project of great importance. And it will transport hydrogen produced from offshore wind or onshore wind and solar PV within Europe and also allows for hydrogen inputs from outside Europe. In order to have proper technology and infrastructure, it is also important to provide adequate funding for research and innovation. I would like to give you some information coming from, from the German national hydrogen strategy that they are underlining that the, the funding is not enough and now we have also the challenge of very, very cheap fossil fuels. As underlined in the German national hydrogen strategy, reliable, affordable and suitable and sustainable ways of producing hydrogen are essential for its future use. Now it is time to construct demonstration plants at an industrial scale 
in order to, to upgrade scale and scale this up further to ensure that the cost of hydrogen production decreases considerably. In addition, the, the strategy, which is always mentioned, the German national st hydrogen strategy, concludes that the current framework does not allow hydrogen to be generated and used in an economically viable man manner. The reason is that fossil fuels in particular continue to be much cheaper. In order for hydrogen to become economically viable, we need to continue to bring down the price of hydrogen technology, and this is the case for me. That's why we have to, to drive forward technological progress and economies of scale and probably obtain the critical mass of hydrogen needed for some initial sector to switch from the new technology to the new technology, the production and use of hydrogen needed to be sped up globally. In this regard, we have to stand together with the Commission and the Parliament, of course, as, as institutions in order to increase the level of funding concerning research and innovation. As you maybe know, the, the final proposal that it comes from, from, the Euro, from the European Council is not acceptable in the Parliament. We need to increase funding in terms of Horizon Europe. We need to have much more funding in order to become pioneers in terms of technology and, of course, hydrogen. In this regard, I think that we have to stand with the Commission and we're asking national governments and member states to stand with us in order to have enough funding for develop new technologies for power packs. Once again, thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much uh, for your interesting speech with regards to time infrastructure, technology and investment. Uh, very well structured and clear. Uh, I understand that, uh, unfortunately, you have a very tight agenda and you have to leave. So uh, we are going to take some questions for you. Um, uh, but, but before we go to the questions, uh, let me ask one. So, so we will take some questions from you from the audience. Let's see if there are any, and I can get the questions through the internal chat or they connect directly. But before that, I have I have a question. You have talked about the European perspective and a little bit about the Greek perspective. Uh, um, how do you see the rest of Europe? So as a European Parliament member and being in, in the rest on, on these commissions, uh, how do you see the rest of Europe? How do you see the rest of Europe with regards to to Greece, uh, with regards to to hydrogen? Yes, we have to have a complementary approach in terms of European uh, Union market. We have to regulate and we have to facilitate the market in order to have the the, the expanded capacity of hydrogen. Otherwise, the needs are huge. And of course, we will ask for alternatives. That's why I'm asking first for having a, a concrete and complementary strategy between member states. We need to have for every and each member state the, the national strategy of hydrogen. At the same time, we need them to complement to complement the European strategy for hydrogen. The first step belongs to the Commission. The Commission is asked to give us further details concerning. The, the hydrogen strategy, especially on the on the issues of capacity and milestones, because I have already mentioned that uh, we are not so ambitious uh, concerning the the first target that it is uh, setting on on 2024. The second is uh, that the Commission has to clarify the terms of governance of uh, hydrogen alliance, and the third, of course, belongs to the member states that they have to 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 plan and to organize their own. Uh, their own hydrogen strategy in order to to, to complement the the, the the holistic approach that we need in, within the EU. So thank you very much. So uh, according to if I understand it well from from your answer, you have a lot of work to do. So we have a lot of work to do, and you have a lot of work to do also at the Commission level and the member states level. Um, well, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience. I think that they may be expecting to reach the end of the roundtable for the questions. So we are not having questions so far from the audience. So, so if you don't I mind, have... we'll pass it. yeah. 
As I can see, there is one. The hydrogen future may depend on input from uh, instance from North Africa. Do you see strategic alliance with this region? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I think that we have to start from 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 our home, and we have to 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 increase the production from for for renewables, especially in Greece. We have the capacity to increase the production in terms of soft, offshore wind uh, mills and also in terms of PV solars. Uh, but it is also important to understand that uh, North Africa is uh, not only a potential but a, a partner in terms of of energy security and in terms of energy of supply of energy supply. Of course, I fully agree with you. It is it is time to to engage North Africa not only by increasing our differentiation of uh, of energy suppliers, but also increasing the level of uh, everyday life of their people. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean uh, human rights. I think that's a, another relevant issue that you are touching upon that uh, north of Africa has a lot of insulation capacity. It has also wind. There were projects in the past that didn't succeed. I guess Desertec was one of the projects with regards to solar. So that's a possibility. But then, I mean, it's also a possibility of helping uh, people develop and live better, uh, both in north of Africa and, and, and in our countries. So, well, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And, and now we will, uh, we will go to the next speaker. Thank uh, you very much. Who is uh, Mr. Enrique Viguera. Mr. Enrique Viguera, mm, yeah, I, I already introduced you. Um, yeah. um, just to repeat briefly, you are the Spanish ambassador for those people who joined lately. You are the Spanish ambassador to the Hellenic Republic, and you have a long-standing uh, knowledge and history, both as ambassador but also in the energy field and the European Union field, since you were ambassador at large for energy issues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Spain. So thank you very much, and I hope this time we can go ahead with the sound and technology issues. It, it's it's we're in, in a in a session that talks about uh, innovation and technology and hydrogen, and you see technology plays <laughs> bad tricks sometimes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. I don't know if uh, the sound goes well now. Is it good? Can I be here? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Ah, thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, no, thank you very much for having me once again. This year, I, uh, I've been participating in this symposium for some years so far, perhaps for the fact that I was ambassador at large for uh, energy affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Spain. So uh, I usually give uh, the Spanish input to it. And as you said, uh, due to my uh, European Union uh, also knowledge, and um, uh, dedication, uh, I can also uh, um, put forward some uh, some ideas uh, about the European Union. Uh, but uh, in this particular occasion, I have uh, uh, produced a, a PowerPoint presentation that I don't know if uh, I can share with you. You have it? Yeah. Here we are. Uh, yes, um, uh, this is it. Uh, so, can I can I change pages? Or you do it for me? If it's 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 on your computer. It's in the sir. You have to yes. change because it's in your computer. So it yes. Is. Oh, then okay. then I move it. Okay, okay, I can yeah. do it. Fantastic. You can put it on the slideshow if you want. So yeah. You, you Fantastic. Slideshow downstairs and. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Um, I, I will start by saying that uh, I mean, of course, uh, you uh, as expert all know the importance of uh, uh, green hydrogen uh, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, would be absolutely necessary for reaching the EU uh, 2050 full decarbonization target. Now uh, it's uh, legal 
uh, by then uh, some say that it may represent at least 25 percent of the, the total world energy net demand so we are better getting prepared for that moment but the main challenge today is uh, it's a relatively high high cost of production but estimations uh, are that by 2030 uh, just only in 20 in 10 years time it pray it price may be half or even more and could become uh, competitive, competitive with fossil fuels. Um, but, but for this, uh, innovation, investments, and incentives to our research and development are essential to accelerate scale economics and uh, the learning curve. Um, in the European Union, I mean, we are very conscious of that. And for that reason, uh, we have all embraced the Green Europe uh, idea. Uh, and uh, the nitty-gritty of this is um, the communication by the Commission uh, some months ago about uh, the hydrogen strategy, uh, where uh, it is says that uh, regulations and a lot of subsidies uh, may be needed for the installations of uh, electrolyzers uh, for 2024, 6 gigawatts, uh, and uh, 40 gigawatts uh, in 2030. Um, we are lately hearing that... Uh, the target of redu reducing uh, CO2 emissions by 2030 may become also uh, uh, compulsory if uh, legislation may be approved by the European uh, Council before the end of this year during the German presidency. I think that if this is done together with the 2050 full decarbonization um, uh, idea, um, this may, may be a big, big uh, legal incentive for the uh, European Union as a whole, and also for member countries to uh, to foster uh, uh, green uh, hydrogen uh, production. So, uh, but of course, uh, we will be needing a lot of money for that. The European Union says that, uh, or the Commission says that uh, uh, it will put forward from five to thirty billion euros through the new innovation fund for the next ten years. Mm, but uh, of course, this is uh, not too much money comparable with, uh, say, almost 500 billion uh, uh, euros in private and, and public investments that um, we may be needing to uh, to increase the uh, capacity in hydrogen uh, production by 20, 2050. Um, of course, uh, Spain was very much prepared to follow suit. And uh, it seems that uh, the Spanish Ministry for Industry was waiting for the communication to see the light to launch its own uh, strategy. Uh, we also had in July 2020 uh, our hydrogen roadmap uh, for public consultation with the objective, say immediate term, uh, to prepare uh, the uh, regulatory framework and, and also uh, promote research and innovation in this particular field. But also in the medium term uh, for 2030, uh, ensure the uh, and install capacity of four gigawatts of electrolyzers. This is uh, represent roughly speaking 10% of the EU total, and uh, as some other issues concerning the uh, hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen pr production. But uh, for this, uh, it is estimated that we will needing nine billion euros um, of, of public and private investments plan until 2050. I think that uh, there may be other incentives, so commercial incentives that may not be needing uh, uh, subsidies. It may, it may come back in terms of uh, uh, commercial, uh, commercial revenues eventually. But this is part of uh, the just transition in our case, because Spain has committed, um, like most of the member countries, to give away uh, with old, uh, mm, old uh, fuels, uh, coal mines, uh, um, cement plants, uh, coal power, uh, fire pa power plants, uh, including nuclear power plants. Uh, by 2030, 35, I think uh, Spain will give away with all these six uh, nuclear plants or seven nuclear plants we have uh, uh, today in Spain fully operational. So th this this may represent uh, a big uh, a big impulse, really. Um, we we have a a, a different uh, a, a different side on the. Uh, um, uh, green hydrogen production, which is the green hydrogen uh, transmission. And uh, apart from uh, the production, uh, Spain uh, and particularly Enagas, uh, 
uh, with whom I mean, uh, Hoops uh, CEO I had the, the opportunity to talk in the last few days concerning this uh, issue uh, particularly. I mean, he, he is very much engaged in, in Greece as well, because uh, as you know, Enagas is in uh, Desra and also in TAP, and he is very much engaged in what's going on in Greece in terms of uh, also uh, um, gas and gas development. So he was uh, very open uh, in, in, in telling me that uh, Enagas uh, is uh, fully committed uh, towards uh, green hydrogen and a part of running several, um, uh, several case, uh, several production units, which uh, some of them will be shown later on, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a network uh, and due to its uh, geographical uh, location and uh, availability of resources and infrastructure, um, we are very much committed that Spain may become also a gateway for, for green hydrogen to, to, uh, to Europe, to Central Europe. Uh, this is a matter that uh, will not come alone. Uh, Spain, Enagas has been working with SNAM, uh, the Italian um, uh, gas uh, network operator, in order to make sure that the you know, sufficient investments will be there in order to, to bring uh, the necessary uh, green hydrogen uh, needed for, uh, for, for Central Europe uh, uh, demand. Uh, nowadays, we have, uh, like Italy, uh, a very uh, good uh, uh, network, but uh, it is considered that um, uh, still uh, in Spain, it will be uh, needed between 27 billion and 74 billion euro, I mean euros, which is not uh, that much uh, considering uh, the, uh, the the importance of of the new technology for the for the adaptation, um, Enagas will take into into account not only the network it has, uh, but also the uh, the network of LNG terminals, which is the most uh, complete in in Europe, as as, as you uh, all know, and also the the storage uh, capabilities that uh, today. Uh, we have apart from uh, the pipe the pipeline in use um for this reason uh, snam and uh, um and uh, enagas have uh, presented a, 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 a project called green crane project uh, which is now a candidate for project of special interest of the european union uh, by which uh, the intention is to uh, to bring uh, all this into reality uh, to turn uh, uh, Spain as well as Italy as, a, as an export uh, green hydrogen uh, hub to the rest of the continent. Uh, um, and uh, well, to do this, uh, uh, we'll need also to uh, put into operation some uh, green electrolysis plants uh, that are, are being constructed in Asturias, País Vasco, Castilla, León, several uh, units that. Uh, um, Enagas is uh, working on alone or with uh, other partners in, in order to uh, to try to to get uh, the uh, renewable electricity generation needed in, in principle two gigawatts from wind and solar uh, from this uh, um, joint venture between SNAM and, and Enagas one of them will be one gigawatt within Spain and uh, the green energy production will be 1.9 gigawatts um, from, from it, 0 0.4 will come uh, uh, from, from Spain. Well, this is the, uh, the network. Uh, let me just uh, pass very briefly to some concrete uh, e examples of uh, uh, units of uh, um, green nitrogen production that have been uh, operational, almost operational in Spain. The first one I want to share with you is uh, the one uh, existing uh, in Mallorca, uh, which is uh, actually the largest green hydrogen plant, 10 megawatts in Europe, but intended for transportation fuel. So uh, this is really pioneer uh, in Spain. Um, also, the uh, local authorities in Mallorca are very much involved. And uh, the cost of the project is 50 million uh, euros which will provide uh, full production in a plant by next year, 2021, basically to supply vehicles with uh, sustainable energy, both public uh, buses, but also a private fleet, uh, renter cars, courtesy vehicles, and so on, in a very substantial territory of the main island, Mallorca. The idea, of course, is that if it works, 
we can enlarge uh, this uh, triangle uh, to the whole island and subsequently to the whole Balearic Islands. Um, according to the uh, development, of course, it could, be, it could be a very interesting precedent for islands elsewhere. I mean, since I'm, I'm here in, in Greece, I know the importance of what would, would it mean to have the possibility to produce uh, green hydrogens locally and then uh, the, the possibility of distributing um, uh, um, a green um, hydrogen to the to the vehicle to the vehicles that circulate uh, through the islands. So this is uh, a project which looks uh, very very much interest. Another one, this is by Iberdrola. Uh, you know that Iberdrola is also present uh, here in in Greece. It is I think the fourth or the fifth um, most important uh, renewable energy company uh, in Greece right now. It's present all over the world. And now uh, Iberdrola has uh, started a, a very interesting project. Um, together with Fertiberia, uh, which is a company um, uh, which is uh, manufacturing fertilizers, uh, right in the center of Spain, in Puerto Llano, in Ciudad Real, uh, investing 150 million uh, euros uh, to build a green hydrogen plant um, with, a, with a 100 megawatts photovoltaic solar plant, then a lithium ion uh, battery system uh, with a storage capacity of uh, 20 megawatts, and one electrolytic hydrogen production system. So uh, they will be producing green, uh, green hydrogen that will be used, the whole production, at the uh, Fertiberia ammonia plant uh, to, to, to manufacture particularly green, green fertilizers. Um, this is another uh, use of uh, uh, green uh, um, hydrogen uh, production on, on the spot. Uh, and the last one uh, is an uh, example that I want to share with you, is uh, the one that uh, will be uh, 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 taking place in, 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 in uh, Port of Bilbao uh, by Repsol, uh, very much involving also with the local uh, municipal, uh, municipal authorities of the Basque Country, uh, which is uh, 60 million uh, euros uh, Repsol Petronor, which is also uh, associated with uh, Repsol, uh, investment for a, a combined plant, a 10 megawatts uh, green hydrogen, uh, which will be used to produce synthetic fuels, uh, 10,000 uh, 10, uh, liters a day, uh, approximately. And it will also include a, a carbon capture project uh, and a fuel from waste plant that are also in that, uh, in that part of, uh, of the port of, of Bilbao. Uh, I will also emphasize that uh, it is very, very important also the engagement of uh, the local authority of this uh, pioneer uh, example. So you see, uh, perhaps um, Spain is not at the level of some other European Union partners like uh, Germany, for example, or, or, or France, but um, uh, the matter has been taken very, very seriously. Uh, and uh, there are projects here or there that are uh, combining different technologies um, in order to, uh, to produce uh, green hydrogen and uh, not leaving uh, any footprint uh, into the uh, into the atmosphere. So, last but not least, um, uh, and this re reminds me very much uh, of uh, the discussion we had uh, ten or fifteen years ago about uh, renewable energy, when renewable energy was becoming more competitive than fossil fuels, which is a reality today. And by then, was just uh, a matter of uh, almost science fiction. Today, the discussion is when green hydrogen may be competitive, vis-à-vis. Uh, -vis other types of uh, hydrogen, the green hydrogen, the uh, natural gas, or some other fossil fuels. Uh, as I said before, I think that uh, uh, the, the matter of, uh, of making uh, obligatory uh, targets, uh, it's a very positive issue to force uh, member countries and legislators and regulators to, 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 to try to foster uh, innovation and research and development uh, in Europe. Um, of course, um, some people say that uh, if uh, the cost of uh, emitting CO2 to the atmosphere become more and more uh, expensive, it would for the boost uh, the possibility of uh, investors uh, to, to go into the production of uh, green uh, hydrogen uh, um, production. So um, 
now I'm, uh, I was an apostle uh, 15 years ago of, of renewable energy. I'm still, I'm still are. Uh, I'm still, uh, and um, uh, of course, uh, nowadays uh, regarding green uh, hydrogen, um, I think it, it has uh, uh, taken uh, also the, 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 the post to speak of uh, um, uh, renewable energy and maybe become really the solution of uh, the uh, decarbonization we are all wanting for 2050. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, it, it, it's very interesting to see uh, some of the Spanish examples that are in production or near to be in production. In fact, uh, there was a huge announcement also yesterday of a 1,000 uh, million euro new plant in Huelva by Iberdrola. So wow. So so it's in, in Huelva. So so it, it seems that the regulatory movements are making its impact. Uh, Good in, in Spain. So I don't know if you uh, would you be able to stay at the end for the questions? Will you of, course, questions? of course, of course. Okay. Yeah. So, so thank you very much. Uh, for this interesting presentation on, and, and also for the outlook, because uh, many European countries have islands, uh, so not only Greece, I, I guess Italy has also some islands. Uh, um, so for, for these examples that could be used in different contexts and could be applicable to different countries. So um, now we are going to go to the next, we finish with the keynote speakers in, in our table and we are going to go to the participants. The participants will have again between 10 and 15 minutes time to present uh, their ideas. And, and we will start uh, by Bert Stuch. And I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name well, Bert. Uh, uh, he's Vice President of Innovation at the Energy Delta Institute. Uh, and uh, he's a specialist basically on energy transition. So the Energy Delta Institute is an educational and research institution um, in the Netherlands that was founded with the help of, of some uh, energy companies. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you can put... Uh, hello, you, we see you now. Great. We don't hear you, though. Um, and, and before being there, he worked for other companies. For example, he worked for Shell, which is which make, make, it makes it pretty interesting because you have a traditional oil and gas company that is transforming itself, and, and probably he can provide us with with a very interesting viewpoint. So that's right. So Bert, without further ado, the floor is yours. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Miguel, and uh, very exciting to be uh, very excited to be here. Um, yes, uh, interesting to see what's happening with Shell. Of course, they're going. I don't know if that's that, well. There's a lot of news of it in the Dutch newspapers now. The the, the massive reorganisation which is taking place, uh, which is partially uh, explained by, uh, of course, the slump in the oil and gas industry of this moment, uh, Corona induced, uh, of course. But also, uh, it's being strongly positioned as a move towards a greener uh, company, a, a, a bigger role in the greening of the energy system. So uh, I, I made that step uh, a number of years ago. You could argue that uh, I stepped away from Shell and, and, and became much more involved in, in, in greening uh, the energy system. And now the whole company is following. So maybe I should go back in, in due course. Um, I wanted to share a few things with you, uh, and in fact, only rather briefly. And uh, thank you very much for your introduction uh, of me. Uh, one, one other thing which I'm doing, I, 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 if I listen, hear it uh, well, I don't think you mentioned that, but I'm also a vice chair of the committee uh, of the International Energy Agency, which deals with uh, research and technology. And in fact, a few insights which uh, I would like to, uh, to share with you um, uh, are also based on, on some of the insights which have, have come from there. Um, Let's let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, and you know, I've called uh, the whole talk uh, "work in progress," and and I uh, really believe that is 
exactly the characterization of uh, where hydrogen is in. It is uh, moving beyond being a promise only. Uh, in fact, we've had a, a few periods in the past where the expectations for hydrogen were very, very high. Uh, even back in the, in the 70s, when uh, nuclear was at its heyday, uh, many people expected that hydrogen would then be uh, a logical uh, companion of this, of this, at least that was then believed, very cheap source of power. So uh, make hydrogen with it and also feed the part of the uh, economy which needs molecules. Well, uh, technologically it was more complex and perhaps power did not become as cheap as expected, as quickly as expected. Uh, and, and later on, we've had a, a number of periods of, of great expectations and then somewhat to dampen the expectations. But if the signs are not um, uh, misguiding us or misleading us, uh, it seems that there's now a, a real growth in, um, in enthusiasm about, uh, about hydrogen, which, which is stronger perhaps than what we've seen in the past. Uh, coming back to the International Energy Agency, they, they now they have this, this scenario, which they call the sustainable development scenario, which for each technology in the energy space tracks an avenue to, to, to a size which is big enough to make the change we need to get uh, to sustainable development. And they look at uh, many technologies in the uh, energy supply space, like solar and wind, etc. But they also look at technologies which, which glue it all together, if you like, the energy integration aspect, and hydrogen is a cornerstone of that part. And, and they, they then say, well, is it sufficient? Does it go fast enough? For instance, a domain like solar or electric cars are moving fast enough if we want to become sustainable. But other domains uh, stay far behind. Uh, for instance, uh, the industrial transformation we need, uh, it doesn't go as fast as it should. And other domains are uh, in the balance. Uh, development is fast, but perhaps not fast enough. And hydrogen uh, is one of these technology areas where there is move, uh, there is a lot of movement, but uh, more efforts are needed to keep us on track. And just to illustrate that uh, by the latest analysis on the next sheet. Um, yes, the next sheet, please. There we go. As as by way of illustration and you know what the orange light there means or or you know more efforts needed uh is development and deployment must accelerate and what is shown in this uh little graph is how much um uh, clean or green uh, hydrogen is produced uh today and we see actually unfortunately a rather flat line from 2050 15 up to 2019 Picking up somewhat, uh, although that may now be hampered because of Corona in 2020, and then the announcements, and uh, we heard already a few projects uh, from the ambassador, and in fact, uh, even Miguel dropped uh, one in. There are announcements of new green energy projects, which show a significant growth in the four-year period ahead of us, but to stay on course, uh, the green bar shows how far we should be in 2030. Now, this is not impossible. This is a growth curve which can be achieved, but you can see how dramatically the market must grow in terms of production of, uh, or of low carbon hydrogen, or green hydrogen, uh, to stay in the color coding. Uh, let's look at the next uh, sheet. So more has to be done. But uh, there's also good news. The, the, the basis for hydrogen developments gets stronger and stronger. And we see that uh, in, in many, many places. And just uh, if we, first of all, perhaps look at the uh, electrolysis. This is, uh, of course, very, very closely linked to the graph we saw earlier. We see that it is ramping up right to the period of 2023. And not only does the, uh, uh, do the capacity additions grow in the coming years, but also you see that the individual project size, which is the light blue at the bottom, is also growing. Interesting enough, uh, if you look at, for instance, 2023, 20, uh, almost 30 or 40 percent of the growth in that year is taken up by a single very, very large project, which where we could reach 
indeed uh, something like, I have to check myself, about 300 uh, megawatts or so uh, in, the, uh, uh, in that order of magnitude. And then it begins um, to become very, very meaningful. Some other aspects, uh, we see that hydrogen in the transport sector is rapidly expanding, but from a very, very low base. And notably, of course, we look at hydrogen also in these uh, more complex transport sectors like heavy transport, um, uh, shipping even. Uh, injecting and blending hydrogen with gas in, in networks can, uh, can also be a, a quick starter of hydrogen uh, getting it to consumers. But beyond that, and that's also very interesting, uh, gas grids can be converted completely from natural gas into uh, hydrogen uh, grids. Not always easy. But we've seen, uh, we begin to see examples of that. For instance, in the Netherlands, uh, only very recently, uh, uh, a gas line was converted to a hydrogen line. Hydrogen is, of course, extensively used in the industry. So there's a vast potential market there also for low carbon hydrogen. That's a pure replacement almost of the, uh, the grey hydrogen, if that's the right term, hydrogen from, uh, from gas, mostly through steam reforming, uh, which is now being used. But then the last thing is also very important. I think uh, the presentation of the ambassador made it very clear that the polit and also for um, uh, the, uh, the member of parliament uh, of Europe, the political momentum for hydrogen is growing very, very rapidly all over the world. Uh, and that's um, uh, big plans, very concrete plans, very precise plans very often. Uh, and that provides guidance and also confidence for market parties to step into step in this arena. Very, very important and happening right now. Um, next slide, please. Um, that uh, fact that policies are um, uh, getting clearer and, and uh, therefore also more helpful uh, is also putting, if you like, the owners on policy makers. So uh, the policies have to be sound and consistent. There has to be confidence in the markets that we will stay at it. Um, so, you know, the, the, the perspective must be clear, obviously, but also realistic. There's, there's no point in uh, getting sort of over ambitious as policymakers on how fast hydrogen could develop if there is no uh, matching uh, amount of public funds or indeed uh, matching ability of companies to step into it. It has to be, yes, ambitious, but also needs to be re realism there. Um, International, cross, uh, international cooperation, also cross-sectoral cooperation, that's also important. If you look at international cooperation, uh, for instance, the EU hydrogen strategy, uh, which is ideally consistent with the hydrogen strategy of individual member countries and can provide even an additional boost to that, which can be massive. Um, it, particularly at national scale, very often critical barriers to hydrogen deployment have to be removed, and those can be regulations about how much hydrogen can be put in gas networks, sometimes stricter than necessary. Uh, of course, safety is, is paramount, of paramount importance, but uh, look whether that is appropriate. Uh, all sorts of barriers uh, can hamper the development if they are not taken away. Uh, and I think uh, we have to uh, more in general stimulate low carbon hydrogen demand. I already mentioned the industry, uh, but of course the, the, the mobility sector is another uh, very, very important one where government policies, be it investment subsidies, be it uh, exploitation subsidies, can, uh, can make quite a big difference there. Next slide, please. It's not as if we are ready uh, technologically to, to make all the breakthroughs necessary today. And I think another aspect of this, this consistent policy portfolio is that right up the, uh, the famous S curve uh, or the uh, TRL curve, technology readiness level curve, uh, which starts right at the left with projects and technology still in the R&D phase, uh, in the middle where we you know, begin to reach competitiveness right up to the end where technologies become mature. Already the ambassador showed uh, how hydrogen uh, is, is sort of getting more, more and more competitive with grey hydrogen. That's not the only thing you have to be competitive with, uh, I should uh, stress there. But you can see that uh, things uh, in, in, uh, on the left side, like uh, seawater electrolysis, very important if we want to combine 
the breakthrough we see in offshore wind energy with hydrogen uh, production, uh, or indeed hydrogen reduction for steel production, uh, steel alone uh, accounts for about 10% of global uh, CO2 emissions and massive changes would be possible if hydrogen there becomes uh, the backbone rather than coal. Uh, but that is not easy. Um, uh, many countries are working on it, uh, Sweden, Austria, uh, we're looking at it in the Netherlands and I'm sure also in Germany. Uh, then more at the medium level, uh, you obviously look also at uh, things like hydrogen derived fuels. Can we uh, methanize hydrogen, uh, combine it with CO2. Uh, also, other industrial processes based on uh, uh, on hydrogen rather than on what it is based now. Uh, so we move uh, forward to that, but we reach already the demonstration stage in many of these uh, uh, domains. And then in the maturing market, uh, clearly fuel cells, electrolyzers, et cetera, et cetera, still have to become cheaper. Uh, there, of course, it's also very crucial for governments to support the market uptake there, uh, remove barriers, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, a consistent set of policies pulls hydrogen all the way up from the uh, innovative phase. And there's a lot uh, still in that innovation phase in the hydrogen arena, uh, right up to the possibilities of using it. Let's move to the next one. Next sheet, please. Um, that's, that's really the last one, I think, uh, on, on, on policies. Uh, there also, be realistic, yes, the whole uh, S-curve has to be supported, but try and look where the near-term opportunities are to get the thing going as fast as possible. Here are four domains. I already mentioned it, gas grids, either uh, feeding hydrogen in existing gas grids, or indeed, <clears throat> in some cases, converting gas grids to hydrogen grids. Um, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, there is a, a double gas network, one for uh, low cal calorific value gas. There's a lot of nitrogen in it that's traditionally fed by the Groningen field, won't go into that now. And uh, I would say ordinary uh, methane, uh, normal natural gas. Uh, it may be that uh, we are therefore, if you like, somewhat oversupplied in terms of gas networks, can we utilize that position, uh, that situation, to convert uh, some of that into hydrogen networks? We're looking into that. Gas grids provide a very, very good starting point. Industrial hubs, I already mentioned it, huge amount of hydrogen already used in there. Uh, good, good, good early opportunities to convert it to low carbon uh, hydrogen. Then the mobility sector, um, uh, that's, I think, also quite obvious. In some cases, no, no easy alternative. And something uh, which was discussed uh, earlier already, I think that hydrogen uh, will not or cannot rely only on the hydrogen which is made within the boundaries of any country. Uh, hydrogen has to become an international commodity, perhaps even beyond the, the borders of the EU, but certainly within the EU. Um, uh, it, it needs to be, become a tradable commodity and, and being made in large volumes on locations where it is logical, being that the wind region, North Sea, be that the solar region in the south. Uh, let's go to the next sheet, please. Because that is the last one. Uh, all in all, I would say that with these four uh, domains where early opportunities are, uh, with a, a clear view nationally and at an EU le level of how we pull this whole hydrogen future right from the innovation phase up to the market phase um, and with a uh, consistent policy set, which also addresses, for instance, barriers which are still there in the market. Uh, I think we can say that, that there, is a, there are many, many opportunities. Um, I think still some realism is needed in terms of the speed at which technologies develop but we've also seen, and uh, again, that was illustrated earlier, that uh, once we really get at it, prices can drop very, very rapidly and market growth can also go very, very quickly. Uh, there's no doubt about it that the opportunities are there, they abound, uh, but uh, we all have to work on it. It's, uh, it's a work in progress. And with that, uh, I'd like to give the word back to Miguel.
So thank you very much, Bert. I think it's, I mean, for somebody that is in an educational academic institute, but very close to industry, you're providing a very realistic perspective. Um, I think, in, in fact, you're also sponsoring this session, so I want to especially thank you for sponsoring. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I like the work in, in progress view that you are providing. And especially tying it up with the S corps or the technology readiness corps, which is a very valid uh, methodology for studying new technologies. So thank you very much. Uh, we will go to the next speaker and then leave the questions until the end of the roundtable. Okay. So um, our next speaker is Walburga Hemetsberger. Um, She's the CEO of uh, Solar Power Europe. Uh, but she has, in fact, she's, she's been a board member of either in Europe. So I think she has somehow the two hat perspective of solar power and hydrogen and see some things that are real right now and then the working progress. So, uh, I mean, it's interesting to me that with a green law and business administration from Leopold Franzens Universität uh, Innsbruck, you have had a very extensive experience in Europe, both of uh, policy levels in, capi in developing capital markets, in banks. So, so you have a very, very, very complementary experience to what is going on and the investments needed uh, in this new endeavor hydrogen or in the current, which is reality of uh, solar. So I'm interested and hoping to listen a very interesting talk. The floor is yours. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, yes, thanks very much for the introduction. Maybe I should introduce Solar Power Europe a little bit to those who don't know the organization. So we are the European organization, the European Association uh, representing the entire solar sector. We have more than 200 companies and organizations as our members. Um, and yeah, we try to make sure that uh, solar has the best regulatory framework possible in order to thrive in Europe. Um, the, the, the main subject of today uh, is obviously not solar, but hydrogen. But we do believe that uh, Europe has a, a fantastic uh, opportunity today uh, to base, uh, to, to create a hydrogen economy based on renewables. And that's why I would like to, uh, to present to you our vision a little bit from a, from a broader angle and I'm trying to share my screen with you. Just a second. Okay. Apparently need some time. All right. So I hope you can see my presentation now. So uh, as the topic of the of the uh, session was quite broad, I just thought I'll, I also uh, go a little bit broader, hydrogen innovation and technology. Um, yes, I would just like to give you a little uh, a little overview of where we stand today in solar and uh, and an outlook for 2050 um, as a first step, because from our perspective, a renewable hydrogen economy obviously needs to be needs to be built on the main renewables we have, uh, which is wind and solar. So it might be interesting for you to see where we see our solar sector evolving. Uh, then I would like to touch also a little bit on um, on where we stand uh, integrating renewables because this is also one subject which is very often discussed when it comes to hydrogen. And finally, I would like to give you a little bit of a of our vision when it comes to a renewable hydrogen economy. To start with, uh, the state of solar and uh, how we see it evolving. 
Uh, we see currently an uh, incredible growth uh, of solar. The growth, uh, the growth story basically started in 2017. We nearly doubled the um, yearly additions from 2018 to 2019, as you can see here, uh, installing 16 gigawatts in the U27 last year. Although there's a, a little dip, unfortunately, this year, because of uh, COVID, uh, also the dip is very, uh, very small. We expected still in May a dip of around 30% uh, and we had to uh, reduce it or we were able to reduce it in our forecast to 10% just because we've seen also in the third quarter of this year an enormous growth. So there's a little dip here uh, in this year, but the way forward is uh, a way of, uh, of a steep growth curve when it comes to solar, uh, we do see, see that those projects who which have not been able to be realized this year will only be postponed and will strongly take up in 2021 and 2022 again. So what we're looking at in the next five years, and by the way, that's figures from our global market outlook. What we look at is a growth uh, in the order of 20, 25, 30 gigawatt per year. Um, in the next five years. Uh, and one of the reasons is the cost competitiveness of solar. And that is also one element I want to touch upon then a little bit more uh, as well when it comes to hydrogen, because in the end, in order to be, to be able to have competitive renewable hydrogen, you also need to have uh, very low electricity costs. And that's what we're looking at more and more here when it comes to solar. What you see here on this graph is that uh, utility scale solar power plants already beat industrial electricity prices all over Europe. So that's the yellow dots you see on the on the graph. Um, and that's basically from uh, Malaga to Helsinki. So not only in the south of Europe, but also in the north. And that's not our own figures, by the way, but that's figures from, um, from uh, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission themselves. And also when we look at wholesale electricity prices, we do see that with the right um, regulatory framework and with the right uh, interest rate environment, uh, in many countries, solar is already able to beat the wholesale electricity prices uh, at this point in time, also uh, along the whole range, south and north uh, of Europe. Um, and by the way, to add to that, in the last 10 years, uh, we have seen decreases in the solar costs of more than uh, 75%. And we do see also going forward that the solar cost curve is further uh, going down. Now, looking into 2050, we have published uh, our 100% Renewable Europe report just recently, together with uh, the Finnish LUT University, and that's also downloadable at our web page. Um, and what it look, uh, what it shows is that um, when we look, uh, or maybe I should go a step back, what we modeled uh, were two 100% renewable scenarios, uh, because we felt that in the political discussion, um, a pure 100% renewable scenario was missing, or in the in the so far. So we felt the strong need to also uh, look into what would it mean to be 100% based uh, on renewables in Europe. And it was a very interesting exercise because we mainly looked at it from a cost perspective. Um, and what we, what, we, what we found out is that uh, going 100% renewable isn't costing more but less. Uh, and in particular, uh, when we look at the moderate scenario versus the laggard scenario, so laggard scenario, by the way, is a scenario where there's still a lot of fossil fuels in the equation uh, and where we do not reach the Paris Agreement goals. Uh, but the cost comparison is very uplifting because the 100% renewable scenario, and we're not talking about the leadership scenario here, um, is 6% lower in costs uh, than the inadequate action. 
what we what we've seen as well in this scenario is that uh, when you talk about the 100% renewable scenario we're talking about uh, an electrification scenario very very high rate of electrification ranging up as you can see here on the graph by 2050 up to 85% and uh, uh, electrification is very much because of the costs a uh, solar story so Solar is set to become the dominant source of electricity generation in Europe. Um, what we have seen in our scenario is that uh, in a 100% renewable energy system, uh, as of 2040, solar PV will become the, do the dominant source of electricity generation. Uh, so not cap not only capacity wise, but also generation. Uh, and by 2050, we are looking at, depending on the different scenarios, um, between 48% in the laggard scenario, so the inadequate scenario we've been modeling, uh, and up to 63% in the leadership scenario. Now you would uh, maybe tell me that, okay, obviously uh, coming from the solar sector, uh, you yourself are very, very optimistic about that. I would just like to quote Fatih Birol, who was speaking in that uh, Solar Power Summit just this week, uh, you know, the uh, executive director of the Internet International Energy Agency. Uh, and they will come up with very remarkable figures uh, in their next World Energy Outlook mid-October. Uh, and he, had a, he gave us a little bit of a sneak preview. So he said that uh, within five years, solar will be the number one energy source capacity-wise in Europe in five years' time. So uh, it's not just uh, us, you know, being very positive about our sector, but others, even the uh, International Energy Agency has been always very conservative, uh, is acknowledging that the sector is gaining uh, gaining a lot of uh, importance. All right, that's just to show you that obviously it depends a little bit uh, in 2050 on the resources all over Europe. So the no more northern countries will rely more uh, on on wind, and the more southern countries uh, more on uh, on solar. But solar will play a major role in the uh, all over Europe. All right. Um, obviously, one of the one of the um, uh, topics which are always coming up when uh, we talk about renewables is yes, uh, nice, but you can't have them. Uh, all the time, but just wanted to uh, to quickly uh, share with you some innovations we see and where you know the integration of renewables becomes more and more uh, um, part of our our lives. One is uh, grid intelligence solar. Um, so due to innovations we have in system management and advanced power electronics, we uh, we show already in first projects that it is able. Uh, so, so, so that solar plants are able uh, to balance out the grid um, and provide flexibility services to the grid. Uh, what you see here is a graph from a 300 megawatt utility scale plant in California, uh, where they built in 30 megawatt of headroom uh, in order to test in how far, you know, with this uh, capacity, they were able to, to service the grid when needed. And uh, what they found out is that at any point in time throughout the day, it was possible to deliver, um, to deliver grid stability services uh, to the grid. So uh, there's a lot of uh, innovation going on when it comes to utility scale solar and the integration of solar into the grid. And we do think that with uh, more and more also battery storage coming up, uh, we will be able to uh, yeah to to uh, provide uh, base load solar uh, as a next step. Uh, and the other thing is that we see a lot of developments in the small scale area, where uh, you know PV on the roof is coupled with uh, storage systems, uh, with uh, digitalization, home, home automation, and uh, not the least with e-mobility. And, uh, and where the systems uh, become more and more integrated. That was just a, a small excursion into what is happening uh, in the integration of renewables, uh, which will bring me now to renewable hydrogen, which is the main topic of this today's session. So as I said in the, at the very beginning, we, we truly believe that uh, when we talk about hydrogen, we have a great opportunity here in Europe to be front runners when it comes to renewable hydrogen. 
Um, obviously, uh, for the moment, it is still very much uh, a question of prices. Uh, I think uh, yeah, everyone here um, in on the panel uh, knows what the current prices of uh, of hydrogen are when we talk about grey hydrogen. So what we have to beat is 1.5 uh, cent per kilo, uh, uh, 1.5 um, euros per kilo or US dollars per kilo. I mean, it's varying a little bit um, with renewable hydrogen. Uh, and we're not there yet, so that's clear. And it depends also a little bit uh, on um, on yeah how how much of a portion basically the electricity prices are in the uh, in the price of hydrogen. But what you uh, see here in the graph uh, is I'm that to go, so you have to be closing. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but what what you see here, and I'm very I try to be very brief, is that uh, when it comes to renewable hydrogen, we are already getting there, depending on the capex costs of electrolyzers and the cost of uh, renewable electricity. In some regions, uh, we are even already there. Um, obviously, it's not solar only who can drive down the costs, but we do see a great opportunity. Uh, in hybrid systems together with wind, that's what you see here. So, uh, because together on with hyd hybrid uh, plants, uh, we can reach up to 6,000 hours of operation and the full load hours are, the, uh, are what is also driving down the costs of the total uh, production of hydrogen. And uh, that brings me already to my very last slide. How we, can we make it um, a reality? We have to prioritize two things, uh, electrification, direct electri electrification, because in the end, that's still the most cost effective uh, use of electricity. But then when it comes to hydrogen, we have to prioritize renewable hydrogen from our perspective. We have to um, accelerate the deployment uh, of smart and stronger electricity grids, uh, which are also useful for uh, the hydrogen strategy. We do think, because it has been discussed uh, here today already, we do think that we should start uh, with a local renewable hydrogen uh, base uh, and not look too far outside of Europe uh, to start with, because we do think, and you've seen the numbers I have showed to you, that uh, with the renewables uh, we have in Europe, we will be very, uh, very much able to also uh, run a hydrogen economy. And last but not least, um, we have to ob obviously support the uptake of a very robust European electrolyzer industry. We have, a very, we have a number of very promising companies here in Europe and we have to support them uh, with all means. So thank you very much. Um, and many of these things I've just showed you are also available on our webpage uh, where you can uh, look a little bit further on, uh, on what uh, our vision is on green hydrogen as well. Thank you very much. And I'm stop sharing now. Thank you very much. I think it's it's very interesting what you are showing with regards to the status of the solar uh, or wind uh, and then renewables, the forecast for renewables, and also a very interesting suggestion on the uh, on on how to increase usage uh, for the electrolyzers using mixed. Uh, uh, solar wind plants for producing hydrogen and so uh, thank you very much and now we were going to go to the next speaker uh, Mahar, Mr. Mahar Chebo well um, I, I have to say that it's the second time I'm in a round table with you and every time I read your CV I get impressed again so, so you are one of the people that I guess has more knowledge with regards to electronics, controls, venture capital, uh, with regards to energy. You are the chief innovation officer in the global, global digital energy solutions at GE Power and uh, have an extensive experience in all that has to do with software control management reads of energy solutions so i think i hope that you also broaden a little bit because we have talked from a policy level 
on hydrogen and renewables with ended up a little bit with solar, but I hope that you can talk in a little bit broader sense of which where is the status with regards of what is feasible or not feasible uh, with the current, let's see, electronics, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes? Yes, yes. We can see your slides and hear you. OK, perfect. So uh, I'm going to speak about three things, the energy transition, the building's energy transition, and then the mobility transition, and how we could reach a decarbonized Europe in 2050. First thing is, what do these cities have in common? They have in common the need and the wish to decarbonize following the European targets and following also their national targets. They have in common the energy efficiency and they have in common a lot of programs they are putting in place in terms of e-mobility, for example, and EVs. So when we look at the energy transition investments, these are huge. Uh, let me just pick up the first line, and this is a trillion green deal investments. This is for both from public and from private. And of course, we continue things like Horizon, where 30 to 35% of the 100 billion budget will be dedicated to climate, including energy. And then we can go section per section, battery, 250 billion, energy efficiency, the International Energy Agency has estimated the investments in 2017 to be close to 240 billion. So all of these are going, and they have to be synchronized to reach out our targets 2020, 30, and then till we have in 2050 a decarbonized Europe. Now, uh, let me take the example of the groups where I participated. In 2005, we co-founded the European technology platform Smart Grids, a group of about 20 executives who work for the European Commission on what could be the vision research agenda and the deployment around the smart grids. Now, we found out three years ago that you know the vision should be more holistic. So we should bring the heat and the gas and the electricity. We should bring and integrate the whole data with that and then bring a vision 2050. And this is what we have published in June 2018. And uh, myself have been being, beside being in the committee, chairing also the group on the digitalization, where uh, we defined a number of digitalization technologies and use cases that are needed to accelerate the transition to a decarbonized Europe. So what are the topics across the value chain? First, when you see it as a linear here, value chain reality, this is not linear anymore. You have to see it more like a hub, more, more at, uh, as a circle rather than linear. And uh, the equation is will be around how do I provide energy that is as cheap, as close, uh, and as clean as possible to the customers. So, and for that, you, you go through digital twins, you go through uh, uh, digital uh, uh, customers, digital prosumers, commercial industrial customers, buildings, and you have to integrate a massive number of uh, distributed resources to the grid. This is what we call the DERMS grid integration. Uh, and definitely the uh, data scientist role is key in this whole picture. The, when we speak about predictive analytics and simulations, this is about really modeling everything in physics and mass and uh, the rest of chemistry and electronics that we could be able to predict, for example, when something is going to fail, to predict what the flexibility should be, and so on. Now, we speak about 3Ds. Uh, traditionally, when we say that transition is about decarbonization, digitalization, and decentralization, and of course, part of that will be 41% uh, of the total energy demand in electricity would be from uh, car electrification by 2050. Uh, we add to this these three Ds and electrification, we add the fourth D, which is how do I make sure that my transition is being democratized, that it's simple for the users, like it's simple in telecom, to access whatever system, as complicated as it, it would be, but it's like in the planes, for example, the cockpit is very simple for the pilot, but it's because the complexity is behind. And for that, we need to connect the systems of the transmission system operators, distributed system operators, the ESCOs, retailers, and aggregators, 
that we could plan what the user wants, give him real-time answers, and promise him when the services could be delivered. This is the democratized access to energy for any customer, whether it's residential or prosumer customer or commercial industrial customer. Now, let me pick up an example, which is more in big and large buildings here. Uh, and uh, what is typically needed here is not to have separately teams. Some of them do audits, others do uh, some studies, others do some connectivity uh, work on the fields and others provide the software and then go and figure out how that works. The future, and actually today, is turnkey solutions. If you want to democratize the access to energy, you need to have a turnkey solutions where you combine the engineering, engineering means takes any building and make it smart, create a connectivity. Uh, and then if you need to build storage, whether it's geothermal storage or other kind of storage, this is also part, part of the field work. Then you need to monitor it and get all this data because now that the building is connected, you could collect the data and talk with the building. Uh, and this is through software as a service, artificial intelligence, machine learning technologies that we use now in building management systems and energy management systems. What also you need is these large buildings, they need to find out financing. And you need companies who are providing these turnkey solutions that provide financings. And then at the end, you need commitments. If you say, I'm going to save X percent of energy and Y percent of carbon, then you need to commit on that and take guarantees. So uh, uh, this is an, a case where I'm in, involved. So you have here the best combination of the ones who can do engineering, the ones who can provide software, and the ones who can do financing and take commitments. So there was a joint venture called IDEN, uh, comprised of Erin, which is a, a big investor in all industrial and uh, uh, data digital technologies for the energy sector. IDEX, uh, which is like uh, construction uh, engineering uh, known company, uh, one of the top three in France. And then Accenta, which is a, a provider of software as a service for uh, monitoring and uh, for transforming the buildings into smart buildings, monitoring them and getting results, either by taking the every building separately and making quick wins or by uh, providing more engineering around the storage, like geothermal storage, for example, in the context of a low carbon buildings, or even you know finding synergies across a big number of buildings, what we call the eco discrete or uh, the smart grids. So we could achieve with that either if we go quick with smart buildings, for example, where you have energy management solutions and building management solutions fully empowered by artificial intelligence and machine learning, we would achieve like up to 25% benefits. And when we go into more, including the storage, like geothermal storage, for example, then we could achieve up to 60% energy efficiency, 80% reduction in carbon emissions. Same for eco district. Now, let me say two words about the e-mobility. There is a lot going on at the European Commission, and I'm involved in the battery side, uh, the, what you see on the border between the digital and uh, the, the green is where you uh, see heavy usage of digital, for example, traffic management, for example, automotive driving and uh, of the cars where you use software, which is very expensive today on the market. Intel has acquired the software for about 15 billion just for autonomous, autonomous driving. So uh, a number of goals have been fixed in terms of how the electrification and decarbonization can help us to get to zero carbon emissions. In terms of batteries that should uh, last much longer and have much more autonomy. I got my electric car yesterday and then I'm experimenting as a user a lot of things about the battery, the autonomy, the charging and, and also the uh, the charging uh, points everywhere and how the charging points and the providers of cards for charging the, uh, uh, at the charging points should team up and work with the electricity providers. I can tell you there is a lot, a lot of improvements needed from my own experience as a user. 
We worked, and uh, this is in the role I was asked to handle uh, since May by the European Commission is to chair the task force on digital batteries. We worked on two things. First is what are the technologies and use cases across the manufacturing of batteries. So what you see here is the whole value chain of the manufacturing till recycling and the end of life cycle of the batteries. And the second thing, what you see on the right before then, is the usage. How we integrate the batteries in the whole energy system. So we provided that in the report. This is part of the strategic research agenda. And there is a specific report about with all numbers and investments needed for the digitalization of batteries. I will conclude by saying we should start by the uh, needs. What are the needs and the pain points that we need to put in place for the energy transition, low carbon buildings, and e-mobility? Second is, as we did in the uh, examples I mentioned, we need to look at the existing technologies and how we make them evolve. So what's their maturity today and what's needed to make them more mature? 5G, for example, do we need a battery passport? What does it mean to develop a battery passport? These are examples. And then the use cases here. Uh, and also the same thing, how much do we need to develop the use cases and what return we can get? And finally, measure the value. We should start by quick pilots, but not non-ending story pilots, because at the end, we will never get to our targets in 2020, 2030, and 2050 if we do only pilots, because we are scared. So we need to go for pilots, learn, and then go for a scale up of turnkey solutions. And what makes it simple for the end customers at the end is the scale up of turnkey solutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mahar, for providing this, uh, this perspective that shows us the complexity of all the interconnections and connectivity that we have and, and how the the development of technologies evolves and specifically how important batteries are because we've been talking about solar and we've been talking about hydrogen but uh, batteries is one of the critical technologies in both cases since there are complementary services uh, for for the storage of electricity in both cases so so thank you very much uh, now we are going to to go to the next speaker Pierre-Jean Serret. Uh, Pierre-Jean. Pierre-Jean Serret. So, Pierre-Jean, are you there? Okay. Uh, but can you put the sound? So, it seems that Pierre-Jean Serret has a problem with the camera, but is, is he in the sound at least? So, Mm. Okay, Pierre Jean. Hello, hello, Miguel. Hello, Pierre Jean. So, thank you very much for being flexible and taking into account that we are running out of time. Uh, I asked you not to use your presentation, so thank you for not using the presentation and perhaps responding to one or two questions from me that would be a little bit quicker. So Pierre Jean, uh, he's the head of New Business Development and Strategic Innovation and Ventures at ITEMS International, which is a consulting firm uh, in France, a strategic consulting boutique. And, and they work a lot on M&A activity, uh, venture capital activity, uh, with regards to innovation, ventures, and energy. So, so perhaps the, the first question, since, since you operate mostly in France, although you, I know that you operate also in, in other European countries, Germany, Switzerland, whatever, the, the first perhaps question that I have with regards to innovation, technology, and energy is how, I mean, do, do big companies do it all? Or, or how, do they, how do they do all this innovation? So we had uh, Maher, who is from the a large company uh, how do they operate with the startups are they do the startups have a role in energy transition well uh, i have to say that uh, there have been a, a huge investment from the utility sector since uh, 10 years considering the startup uh, technology which are on the way uh, with new technologies such as of course, everything which is digital, but not only digital, and, but also deep tech, 
uh, in the range of H2, of course, but also uh, CCU, CCUS, which is carbon capture, and uh, of course PV and wind. So there have been a, a considerable investment. And the idea, of course, is to be able to pivot to a, a new energy system, which will be much more systemic um, with new integration and coupling between electrical and gas structure, um, being sure also that the consumer will have a gain in the system. So the first move from those uh, big utilities was to, at first to acquire a few startups which are related to uh, customer engagement and flexibility because that's uh, mainly uh, a very quick winner in the system. If you can, for example, if you are able to engage your customer with uh, a few options on energy services, and you can um, uh, convince him that uh, at a few times a week, or they could cut their construction for their or they can use the vehicle at, uh, at times in which there is no congestion in the battery. So the first thing for utilities was to be able to to have those startups looking at uh, consumer engagement, flexibility offers, which mean aggregation of flexibility, of course. Um, everything was only about software development, by the way, so, uh, so creating uh, PPP, virtual power plants. Yeah, Jean, do you hear me? Yes. So we hear you, guys. Yes, maybe, maybe your bandwidth. Maybe it's a good idea that you switch the video off and perhaps try to speak a little bit louder. Sure. Because we have issues with the bandwidth. Okay. Can you can you go ahead? Now? Yes. Speak louder, please. So I was telling you that the first move from the utility world was to acquire started from the software industry at first and then used the uh, maturity concerning the tip tech technology since a few uh, years because it has been nearly 30 years that we are uh, looking at uh, very disruptive tech such as hydrogen and also electrification of uh, mobility for example so the idea is to uh, acquire on series C's uh, deep tech and to get uh, on Serie A software companies uh, because software companies can grow very rapidly uh, but deep tech you must have a market for that so uh, the idea for utilities is to wait uh, until the market is here and being sure that they can acquire uh, the latest mature technologies which uh, uh, involve a lot of capex um, developments and in parallel, um, um, make an exponential growth on software developments. That's the idea. Uh, and so the battle now is mainly on retail uh, markets, um, whereas at first it was only on wholesale because as a utility, you try to lower down the cost of the uh, provision of energy. Um, but then, here we can see a lot of technologies trying to get the value at the end of the value chain. Being sure that the customer will stay with the utility, which is okay. not, not the case anymore, because the customer is switching really rapidly between different types of challengers, and you can see it in the UK market. You can see it also in the French market. Okay, so so, um, th th so we have problems uh, with the sound. Interesting. So, so we have problems with the sound. Yeah, wrong. But my understanding is from from what you are saying is that there is increasing M and activity, and that large players are feeling a strong pressure, especially on the end user side. That's what you are saying, and there is there is a lot of space for software development based companies that help them uh, market their products and services in a differentiated way. So, so um, thank you very much. We're have, we having problems with the sound. What we will do now, uh, 
Thank you, Pierre Jean, for being here, and thank you very, very much for being flexible. Uh, so, so now um, what we are going to do is we'll open the floor for for questions. So I don't know if you can put the uh, if the host can put all the people of the roundtable on the screen. I don't know how many we can see. I don't know if there are questions from the audience. Uh, it, while there is a question from the audience, I mean, uh, let me ask one one myself. Uh, so, if, if you saw my CV, uh, I'm a, a graduate. I mean, I'm a graduate from a French and a Spanish university, but I'm a graduate from a U.S. university, MIT. And and then last this week, in fact, I was the spokesperson of a entrepreneurship jury in Shenzhen, China. Um, so so. My question to the to the people here in the round table is we are we, we're looking at ourselves very europe centric okay uh, what what is the role of asia southeast asia so traditionally i mean you have china but obviously south korea japan as significant players uh, in the energy field, and and then you have other players such as traditional ones such as the U.S. So, so where do we see ourselves in renewable energies, and then in hydrogen with regards to these markets? So, so how how does it look? Somebody wants to take the question. <clears throat> Well, I can uh, I can say one or two things about it. Uh, yes, it was Europe Europe centric, perhaps because we uh, uh, we all have a perspective on Europe. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I do feel that uh, the hydrogen developments are really a global development, and uh, uh, to to my mind, there is no doubt that the same process is taking place in in many many parts of the world. And we have to see how it settles out. I think uh, um, it, it was um, mentioned by my uh, colleague, uh, well, Burga, am I saying that correctly? <laughs> that, uh, that will be, uh, you know, there's a huge opportunity for, for uh, manufacturing capacity in this domain, for instance, electrolysis. But that is a very competitive market, and it will be really challenging, as we've seen in the past, that uh, when, when um, uh, China or Korea move rapidly in this domain, uh, it could very well by, be that they, for the world market, have a, a very, very strong position. So uh, in, on the positive side, we are uh, sort of pushing each other forward because we want to be uh, ahead of the pack uh, there. On the negative side, there is a severe risk, I think, uh, looking from a European perspective, that you may be left out. But that it is itself is taking place all over the world is a good thing. That that's uh, it would be not so good if we we only us would move in this direction, and that is su su surely not the case. I think your your sound is off, Miguel. Sorry, somebody else wants to compliment the answer. Yeah, maybe I can just uh, uh, tap on that. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, you see these developments all over the world, but I think I do think that we're still in a very good position in Europe to also claim uh, a large part of that share. Uh, we have uh, very, oui, oui, oui. very interesting oui, oui. neutralizer oui. companies in Europe. Uh, si c'est rapide, sinon je vous rappelle. Uh, dans we need to close your microphone. Please close your ah, well, I will you the So, uh, and, and, and we do see, see this uh, huge development of renewable solar and wind in Europe, which can drive uh, the economy. So, uh, I do think that uh, Europe can play a major role if we're going bold, actually. But at the same time, I, I, I think we should also you know, uh, try to be as efficient as possible because we're not talking about uh, uh, hydrogen economy uh, as the main goal in Europe. What, what we're talking about as main goal is to decarbonize our energy system. Uh, and we should not only focus, you know, on this uh, new hype hydrogen. It will pl uh, play a major role. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fully certain uh, on that. But uh, we should try to find the best mix which is the most, which brings us 
towards this goal in a most cost effective way and i think we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't lose this goal out of our mind when going forward uh, and we should very very closely look into the usages where hydrogen makes most sense uh, which was from our perspective uh, obviously industry which you cannot decarbonize uh, parts of the industry which you cannot decarbonize uh, but also parts of transport when it comes to aviation or, or shipping, which uh, are difficult to uh, electrify uh, and be very specific on where uh, hydrogen has a, a big advantage and where others, uh, other uh, forms of energy make more sense. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I, I don't know if uh, it, it doesn't seem that we have questions from the audience. Uh, I don't know if any of the panels, the panelists, because it's it's a very diverse panelist. You have, if not, I continue asking questions because I have a ton. But any of the panelists has any questions from any other of the panelists? No, I just wanted to co comment on the question uh, before. Uh, in there are uh, global. Uh, questions for which uh, global solutions could work but you have to take into consideration the local specificities which is mainly the regulation and the structure of the market uh, but when you are building for example wind turbines when you are building batteries when you are building solar panels or turbines simply uh, these are products that are shipped everywhere what the main the main difference is how you make them intelligently work through the digital solutions and also considering the regulations, uh, market per market or uh, uh, structure of the of, of the market by structure of the market this is one thing. Second thing is once a region like Europe, for example, succeeds uh, to build uh, technologies, whether it's for thermal buildings or batteries. Um, uh, then it could become a competitive advantage. Uh, the competitive advantage is being faster than the others, having the good total cost of ownership and having the agility as well and quickly to deploy these technologies versus Asia or Americas. And I believe in engineering, Europe can, ha can have uh, a play here because what we are talking about is very much engineering in intensive. So now we have a question from uh, our ambassador, well, in the panel, Enrique. I don't know if you want to pose the question yourself. You put the microphone on. Uh, want... Yeah, yeah. Well, th th thank you. Just, uh, I don't know if you understood my writings. Uh, I, I, I wrote it very rapidly. But uh, due to the uh, um, uh, intention, apparently, by the German presidency to establish uh, compulsory targets uh, also with the Commission uh, of uh, decreasing the level of uh, carbon emissions by 55 percent and to 2030 together with the full decolonization uh, also uh, um, uh, compulsory by 2050 if this in itself it's a it's a fostering innovation um, in Europe as to make it going more rapidly than in Japan or in the United States, which have other sort of um, uh, incentives. And I think the question is for Bert, no? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the, 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 the simple answer is, is, is yes. I mean, this, this, this positions you and, and, and places you on the track uh, which uh, uh, in itself will create markets, will create conditions for companies to thrive in. Uh, of course, it, it is uh, that alone, I believe, is not enough to get the economic benefits out of this um, uh, out, out of this uh, movement. I think it has to be then uh, complemented with sound innovation policies, which actually make it possible that uh, companies operating in Europe also benefit from this. From these targets and from this, uh, this setting, which is uh, set there, and I think that that's being done. That that is indeed what what Europe intends to uh, set strict regulations, but also work towards an industrial base, an innovation system, which which uh, brings it uh, there. Of course, what also could be a part of it is the carbon border tax, which lo a lot of talk about in in Europe. Not not a very easy thing to organise, but where you uh, actually. Um, 
uh, well, ensure that, that there is a, a sort of a fair competition, uh, uh, at least of the products which are used in Europe, so that um, the more clean companies, if you say it like that, are not outcompeted by, uh, by countries which, which uh, have to do with less regulations, perhaps, uh, although I wouldn't say that Europe is always the best, but, you know, that, that's the, uh, so this, this is also a part of the package. But first of all, uh, setting targets and combining that with a clever and, and, and a sound innovation and industrial policy, that, that is how you move forward. And, and you need both. Only industrial policy, I think, is also insufficient. Okay, so th thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for being here today and sharing all their knowledge. Uh, it's, it's been an honor and pleasure being with you today. Uh, I hope to see you in person next time, so in, in Athens or wherever. Um, I'm a Southern European, so uh, direct contact is important for me. So, so in, seeing you in person is, is nice, but it, it was very interesting and enlightening uh, to talk about the future, uh, some a little bit more immediate and some less immediate, a future that is very dynamic. But as, as I think, uh, I don't know who said it, 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 this future is very interesting to me because it's the place where I'm going to live in. So, so we'll all, all live in the, in the future. Uh, so it's very interesting that we have all this M&A activity, uh, IT-enabled solutions, hydrogen policy, uh, companies uh, operating. Thank you all and keep safe and see you soon thank you thank you